Naomi Sider. Naomi is somebody who is well known within the development community, specifically the Python community, who has made um, constant contributions to free software overall by mentoring people to get involved by programming within the Python language. She's going to be giving a presentation entitled Farewell and Welcome Home, Transition and Inclusion in FOSS. Farewell and Welcome Home, Transition and Inclusion in FOSS, Naomi Sider. Thank you. Uh, one minute here. I'm going to need to uh, switch this over. Let's see. Oh, can't do that. Absolutely. Um, uh, I first met Naomi, oh geez, that was probably about five years ago at the Ohio Linux Fest where she taught a, a Python tutorial and um, nowadays she's um, more active locally in a um, program that's part of Open Hatch which is a, a special workshop for women who want to learn how to program and the example language is Python. I believe that the um, growing up, I was interested in science, physics, astronomy. I made telescopes. Uh, I have to remind you that I grew up back in the dark ages when computers filled rooms uh, and nobody had their own. Uh, it was a, a big thing when the programmable calculator came along. I can remember that. I learned physics on a slide rule, which is actually kind of cool, i tell you the truth. Uh, so I did these things, but I was growing up in a small town in Nebraska. Um, so being into those things made me, by definition, a very, very strange child. Um, the phrase, the child ain't right, comes to mind, I think. Um, but in the 60s, remember, we were in the space race. So being into technology, at least, was not the worst thing in the world. It's hard to understand, a little bit peculiar, but it was OK. Um, you know, I might be the first man on Mars. I think both, all of my grandparents told me that. Um, and note that it would be the first man on Mars. Um, or maybe at least I'd discover an asteroid or something, you know, it's some way to fame. Um, but I had uh, a secret. And um, this secret was that I was transgender. And to tell you the truth, I didn't know that at the time because we had no word for it. Um, and um, it was rather puzzling. Uh, the one thing that I did know is that there was something about me that didn't match up. Uh, what we think now is that there are some genetic and epigenetic um, features that trigger before birth. Um, basically, I guess uh, the 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 short story is that uh, turning out completely male is actually more of a trick than you might think biologically speaking so all of you guys can be happy I guess uh, it didn't work in my case uh, so as I say I didn't know what I was I just didn't know that things were right and what this actually means is it's not right to say that I wanted to be a girl it's really fair to say that I was a girl on the inside just not on the outside uh, this is a pretty hard thing to figure out when you're a kid, particularly in those days. Uh, I think I was probably about 13 when I saw an article about uh, transsexuals in uh, Look magazine, and it, discu it discussed them as tortured individuals uh, who ultimately had to uh, go off and leave family and friends and everyone behind to get a horribly expensive operation and then just disappear in sort of a trans witness protection program. I didn't think I wanted to be that. So there really wasn't much that I could do except try to live with it. 
And I managed to live with it for many, many years. Um, in fact, um, it was more years than I would like to admit. Uh, however, my interest in things tech sort of continued. And um, eventually I ended up uh, in computing. As a matter of fact, as I was finishing a PhD in Greek and Latin up in Madison, uh, I started on uh, the timeshare systems there. Uh, then actually in the mid 80s, I was uh, learning basic on an Apple IIc computer. Uh, this actually happened to be in Greece and it had switched into the Greek character set at odd times. It was kind of an entertaining little machine. Um, so, and then it was after my stay in Greece, I ended up in a uh, private school in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And I was the Latin teacher there. Uh, and along the way, I actually ended up becoming the tech person there because I'd always been sort of a tinkerer. And in fact, I had another Apple IIc. I guess I have to give big props to the, the Apple IIc. It was very important for me. Uh, and what happened was, one day, it started displaying weird characters in spreadsheets. Like instead of a, a tilde, it would display a dollar sign or something like that. Instead of a four, it would display a tilde. I don't, I don't remember exactly what it was, but the characters were wrong. I said, what the heck could this possibly be? Uh, and I, I sort of beat my head on it. I did research. And then I actually sort of wrote down the number that I, the, the character that I was expecting and the character I was getting, converted them both to binary, Huh, seventh bit was wrong sometimes. What are you gonna do about that? <laughs> Little bit more research, and it's like, okay, my Apple IIc, if you opened it up, which by the way, voided the warranty, um, had two rows of eight memory chips in it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So um, after doing a little bit more research, I actually very boldly ordered, not one, but I think I ordered three or four memory chips because I was afraid I was gonna mess it up. Uh, put it in there, basically desoldered the old one, put in the new one, and sure enough, it worked. At that point, I figured I could pretty much do whatever I wanted with computers. That meant, in fact, that when they wanted things fixed at school, I said, sure, I can do it. So it ended up that um, whenever they had a computer problem, they put out an urgent call for the Latin teacher. <laughs> Just one of the many surreal moments in my life, I assure you. Uh, so in the mid-90s, in the mid uh, 90s, I actually discovered uh, this thing called Linux. It was highly recommended to me. I actually bought and still possess Yggdrasil Linux. I tried it out a couple times. It seemed impossibly hard. Um, so I sort of put it aside. Late 90s, I actually switched to, um, you know, decided I really needed to try this again. Uh, and I ended up using Red Hat and um, basically Mandrake I thought was cool, Slackware. I ended up switching things to, uh, to work. <laughs> Some of you remember what this means running Gen 2 on production servers. It was, it was very entertaining, but it, we could compile everything. How much fun is that? I mean, come on. Um, and I, when I say I ran Debian on my laptop, that's really an understatement. I ran Debian, I ran Gentoo, I ran Slackware, I ran whatever I would try to put on there. I did Linux from scratch. I was a glutton for punishment. Um, so I thought it was really cool. Uh, in fact, I thought it was so cool that in the early 2000s, uh, we actually thought, hey, we need to get some people together. So in Fort Wayne, uh, we started a lug. And we ran that lug for about uh, eight or nine years until it uh, merged a couple of years ago with a different lug. Um, no, we're not going to talk about that image either. Although Beth Lynn will recognize the t-shirt. Um, so um, the other thing I did around 2000 was I went out to Linux World uh, in San Francisco. This was, I think, the last Linux World before the suits ruined it. Uh, and uh, Guido Van Rossum was giving a day of uh, tutorials on this language he'd created called Python. And I went to those tutorials. Um, you have to see, at our school, I was teaching programming because we had required everybody in this, uh, it's a private prep school, uh, everybody in the ninth grade had to take programming. They, they had to be able to write simple programs. Um, we had started in Pascal, 
we had experimented a little bit with C, which wasn't as bad as you would have thought. Uh, and at this point, what was coming up as the language of the future was Java. And the thought of teaching, um, you know, a ninth grade soccer player, no offense to soccer players, but they're really not into programming all the time, uh, how to program in Java just made me want to cry. Uh, so on the way back after learning Python, on the way back on the plane, I actually rewrote our entire curriculum in Python and we started using that. We actually started using it to write our software for the school. Um, it was brilliant. Uh, so, um, you know, it's like I wanted to spread the word about this to everybody. Um, and in fact, about a couple years after that, uh, we got word that they were starting this new conference, going to be run by the community uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, called PyCon. So, eh, we put in a paper, um, my assistant and I, we got on the program, we did it the next year. Uh, it was brilliant. And um, as Bethlin said, I, I've, I've done it at Linux Fests. I've done it pretty much any place anyone will uh, actually listen to me. Uh, I love teaching Python. So um, once I started in the Python community, I did a lot of things that are sort of community-ish stuff, I guess. Um, we actually created a patch that um, fixed all of the problems in the Python turtle library that they used to have. So in Python 2.5, that was what was our patch. Uh, I guess, you know, I would say sadly, except actually it was a vast improvement. In Python 2.6, they put in Gregor Lingle's XTurtle library instead. And it can, if you want to have a, a teaching platform for Python that's really easy to get into, I strongly recommend you look at the Turtle library. You can do amazing things with it these days. Um, but I also wrote a book. Um, I am the author of the Quick Python book, second edition which uh, has been translated into Japanese, as a matter of fact. I have a few copies of the Japanese version as well. It's, it's a real hoot. Uh, I think it's called, uh, what is it? Python's Immediate Flying Development uh, is the Japanese translation, which I love. Uh, I would take that at any day. Um, I ended up, uh, actually, I ended up getting a grant from uh, the Python Software Foundation to go to a teaching conference. Uh, it used to be called NECC. It's now called ISTE. Uh, it's a National Teachers of Computing uh, Conference. So I got a grant to go there, and uh, I foolishly told Steve Holden, who was at that time the head of the Python Software Foundation, if there's anything I could ever do to help him out, just let me know. And I said, fine. We'd really like to have a poster session at PyCon. Uh, so I organized and for the first three years ran um, the poster sessions at PyCon, which was... Uh, actually a, a fairly popular feature. In fact, I must have done something right because eventually um, I got put on the Python Software Foundation. Probably one of the biggest honors that I've had in my life. So all of that still didn't change that fact of that little secret I had. It's really hard to explain what that's like um, as I've told people, I can't tell you what it's like because you've never had that experience of not having things match. And until very recently, I've never really had the experience of having them match. Um, what you do is you sort of tell yourself, first of all, no, nah, there's no way I could be that. Nah, I, I really can't be that. Nope. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Uh, then you sort of tell yourself, well, okay, maybe I'm a little bit that, but I'm okay. Uh, I've got it under control. And then you start telling yourself, well, okay, so this is what I am. If I can just keep a lid on it until I die, I'll be okay. Um, my problem was that I wasn't dying fast enough, and I wasn't okay. And besides that, it was no longer the 1960s in Nebraska anymore. So I finally decided that I really needed to do something. I needed to get on with my life because this was just not working. But... Remember, I'd grown up with this sort of narrative that if you were transgender, your only option was to get an enormously expensive operation and then go into the trans witness protection program. You had to leave. Nobody could know. Um, I had a lot of things that I didn't want to leave. I had uh, my involvement in the community. I enjoyed talking, uh, which you may get by the time we get to the end of this pre uh, presentation. Uh, I had a book. What was I going to do with all that stuff? I mean, it would be awkward. It might even be dangerous. If I was going to do this, I would have to tell people. 
Um, this just wasn't going to work. So I'm not really happy with this idea. It was sort of a stupid idea, but it was the only thing that I could come up with at the time. I decided I was going to quit. But then I decided, okay, I'm going to do one last thing. I'm going to do an education summit at PyCon. It will be the last thing. I will just disappear. Um, and I'd, I'd sort of had things all figured out. Um, and it was about, I decided this about a year before uh, that PyCon was to take place. Um, the problem is that as I was going forward, my plans ended up shifting. Um, when I actually started uh, hormone replacement therapy, it was really an almost indescribable change. If you talk to anybody who's trans, they will tell you that finally being on the hormones that match their insight is the greatest drug in the world. All of these problems, being unable to sleep, being unable to do this, being unable to feel comfortable, all of these problems went away. Uh, in other words, it was a treatment that confirmed the diagnosis. Um, I also ended up uh, seeking out online some other people in tech who were transgender and who had survived. Um, and all of that convinced me that there was no point in waiting. I wanted to do it way sooner than a whole year. Um, but that left me with this dilemma. I had this grand project in the works and I would have to leave it. What could I do? Well, again, this is the part that's a little bit embarrassing. It took me months of agonizing to come to the obvious conclusion. Uh, and that is, suppose I just did it. And suppose I was open about it. Shocking. But eventually I got there. And I had some concerns about that. Um, I think the biggest concern is, how is this going to go? And by that, I mean, what happens if people don't like it? What happens if people don't accept it? What are you going to do? And I did a little bit of research, being the nerd that I am. And um, the Python Software Foundation had a diversity statement. PyCon had a code of conduct. Thank you for showing it. Um, the oh, oh, hey, Linux Fest had a code of conduct. This would be another place that I, I would tend to go. Uh, there are a lot of things like that. And so that led me to believe that, okay, so at least on paper, people say I'll be okay. At least if somebody has a problem with it, I can go and to you know, whoever is running the event and say, look, you said you would protect me. This was very, very, very important, let me tell you. Um, so that led me to, to think that I needed to go forward. Of course, I did have a tiny, tiny problem in that I was working at a, an independent prep school in northeastern Indiana. Uh, that was pretty much an insurmountable thing. So I decided that I would have to uh, leave that. Uh, and that's what brought me to the Chicago area, as a matter of fact. Uh, basically, I did have to walk away from 25 years of teaching high school kids how to program. Um, I think that I did a good job at it. I can sort of dig up students of varying ages uh, who believe that. Actually, one of my former students is working for me now. Uh, but I can promise you, I will never be in front of a class of high school students again, and that's not my choice. Um, so I went ahead and decided that I would go uh, and, and test the waters a little bit. I told a few people involved in organizing PyCon what was going on. And they were all very, very positive, as a matter of fact. Uh, I started doing this months before anything was going to happen. And nobody outed me. Everybody was very careful to respect that. They actually were very supportive. They told me that what they had valued was still the same, our common interests in uh, Python and free software, things like that. And honestly, sometimes they even told me secrets that maybe they didn't have to. Um, it seems like when you lay something like, hey, I'm transgender out on the table, everybody feels that well, there's no way we can top that. I'll tell you mine. Um, it's okay, I don't necessarily, I, I was honored, I was really was, but it's okay. Um, so, um, that actually was pretty good. So I decided that the only way I could do this 
was to be as open as I possibly could. Obviously, you can't... It's not something that you can do a little bit. So um, if you're going to transition, you kind of need to be um, pretty open. And, and before you transition, you can't be that open. Uh, but basically, my idea was I was not going to make this a secret to anybody. Uh, it was what it was. Uh, most people were actually um, pretty positive about this. Um, whether or not they meant it, they at least had the good sense to say congratulations, and I appreciated that. Uh, it almost made me wonder what I'd been so afraid of, as a matter of fact. So I went ahead. I kept doing the same things that I'd done, uh, speaking when people would have me, teaching Python, Python whenever I could. Uh, I did my uh, education summit. So um, basically, and you know, this is a picture from the uh, Python workshops. This bottom one is at Flourish. So okay, I'm not thrilled with these pictures, but this is me at least. Uh, and I found that the more open I was, the easier it actually was. Um, openness is a strength in a lot of other places than just software. Um, and uh, it is, you know, open is better than closed. And in fact, my philosophy was I couldn't be outed by anybody if I was already out. Um, and I also think that being open and being uh, sort of transparent with people cuts down a little bit on the awkwardness because they don't have to guess. Uh, if people don't know what's going on, they get nervous. If they get nervous, that's when things start to get worse. So um, all of those things, I think, were, were there. Um, so at this point, um, what I learned is that um, when open source and, and, and the Python community in particular uh, say that they are trying to be inclusive, I think that they mean it. And I think it's a good thing. Okay. Um, so it must all be rainbows and unicorns then, right? Um, well, not entirely. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about um, my reality now. Um, as a trans person, I do not have any legal rights or protections as far as my being trans is concerned. This is actually a misconception a lot of people have. They somehow think that the law protects people. It doesn't. Um, in, in the state of Illinois, technically, I have some uh, protections. If I were to go to Indiana, I would have none. If I were to go to Michigan, I would have none. Uh, so um, a few states have it, but there aren't really very many legal rights or protections. Um, obviously, I don't know. If you're trans, particularly if you're a trans woman, your risk of violence goes way up. Um, everyone who is trans has had to face the possibility uh, and actually the reality that there will be some loss of family and friends. They will not accept you. They will walk away. It happens to almost everybody. And finally, the thing that um, I can't pass up mentioning, uh, basically, you can easily, easily, easily become the punchline of a joke told by a friend who doesn't even realize what they're doing and then doesn't understand why you're offended. Um, if you think back, um, how many times it's an easy punchline to sort of throw in, oh, and she was really a man. Uh, there you go. That's my life. Or if you're not so lucky as to have that happen to you, uh, of course, there is a real risk that you will end up dead. Um, there's Black History Month, there's Women's History Month, there's Pride. In the transgender community, what we, quote, celebrate is all of the people who died that year. Pretty sad. And then there's another complication here, and that is, in addition to being trans, I'm now a woman in technology. And I have a unique perspective because I used to be a guy in technology. I've seen it sort of from both sides. And um, honestly, 
I'm happy where I am. There is no way in the world that I would go back. That's not an option. Uh, but it is a little bit different. Now, and it's not the case here, although it, it, it was the last time I started this talk, uh, at, at Tech Things, I'm, I'm quite often the only woman in the room. Um, I am almost always the only openly trans person in the room. Um, odds tell me that quite often when I think I'm the only openly trans person in the room, there's somebody who isn't out yet, but the only openly one. Uh, I have now had guys that are 20 years younger than I am call me babe. I did not expect that. Um, I've had I've had people explain things, mansplain things to me, that I can think back and say, huh, I wonder if you were even able to type that when I first started doing that. Um, and as I mentioned, um, I can get to be a joke. Yay! Um, another interesting thing, as a man, I was just a nice guy. Now, as a woman, I am simultaneously too nice and too unapproachable. What? How do I do that? And some of you know. Um, I have come to know also a lot of other women in tech. I think the thing that struck me most there is how the level of skill and talent and ability in those women in tech is so unrecognized. Um, I mean, I thought I was looking for this. I thought I was trying to understand that this was the direction I was going. Uh, and even so, being male, I, 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 it was hard for me to see. Uh, it isn't now. And um, I think that um, you know, not being recognized, not being welcomed, not even feeling safe is a reality for women in tech. And that was something that I was not expecting to find out. It was, in a way, something that I was sort of worried about. And it was, I guess, in a sense, a little bit of a surprise to see that it was probably worse than I'd expected it to be. And so I can remember not too long ago thinking, and it was, it was uh, with a, 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 a group of women friends that, that were in tech that I was talking to, and they were talking about some of the things that were just facts of life, and I was thinking, wow, that's a crappy deal. And I suddenly realized, uh-oh, that's me too. Um, and it is. Um, so as a couple of examples, and, and honestly, I, I, I would not claim that I've been through the ringer big time. I know many women who have had far worse. Uh, within about a week of transitioning, I actually posted on a mailing list uh, a report of an incident of, incident of sexism at a regional conference that had been resolved to everyone's uh, satisfaction. In other words, it was not a problem. It was just reporting this sexist thing had been done at the conference, the conference management had done this, everybody was happy. Okay? That should not have been that bad a thing, you would think. Okay? Um, I was accused of demonizing the speaker, whose name I didn't even know, uh, of trampling on his rights to free speech, of trying to start trouble, of starting a witch hunt. Okay? Um, none of which actually had much of anything to do with anything. Um, on another list, and again, this was, was fairly shortly after I transitioned, <laughs> And you may have seen this, that, that comment actually comes off of Reddit about a year ago. Not, yeah, about a year ago. Um, and um, so somebody had said, how will free software be improved by being developed by a black transsexual woman? In other words, making probably like the most extreme case for why would you care about diversity? It's just the code, right? Um, and I said, well, you know, as a white transsexual woman, I'm really glad that some people are objecting to this. Uh, and um, the response that I drew from a white cisgender male was, you, you're really hurting the cause when you do that. We're all humans here. That should be what's important. Why are you trolling this? Or why are you accusing this person of being a troll? Um, and then he went on to say, well, you know, Computing was the creation of white males, so maybe white males really are better at it. I'm not making that up. Uh, 
let alone Grace Hopper, Ada Lovelace, etc. I'm not making that up. So what I want to tell you is I have had it. In some ways, I still benefit, it in many, benefit from it in many ways. Uh, and now I'm in a position where I don't have as much of it. I promise you, when people talk about privilege, they are not making it up. It is real. It does exist. Um, and in the tech world, straight white cisgender male is the default. It's the norm. It is what is assumed when people talk about this. And what that means is if you're not the default, that's sort of your problem. Okay? You're in the minority. Your needs and preferences aren't necessarily considered. Um, you're not always taken seriously. So what can be done about that? Uh, there are a lot of things that can be done. I sort of picked up, I put down three things that came to mind real fast. First of all, it does not help to say, well, things wouldn't be so bad if everybody were just more like us. Uh, which, if you think about it, is the response that a lot of people come back with. Why is this even a problem? You're getting upset about nothing. I didn't mean it that way, etc. cetera. Uh, pro tip number two. Don't pretend that differences don't exist. Uh, I've gotten this from a fair number of people, too, who say, oh, I don't care about your gender. I don't see your gender at all. Um, okay. That's, first of all, clearly just a lie. Uh, and second of all, that takes something that is actually a key part of what is, is my life and says, eh, it doesn't matter. Let's just talk about stuff I want to talk about. So. That's it. Uh, and then just a final note. Um, this one I just sort of throw in because it is so, so obvious and seems to get forgotten so often. If you are called for offending somebody, saying, I'm sorry you were offended, isn't really being sorry, okay? Uh, it's a different thing. Um, so I guess my final final notes here are um, codes of conduct, clear written statements of intent matter enormously. If you are marginalized in any way and you want to know if you're going to be safe, um, a general statement of, no, just trust us, you'll be fine, is not very reassuring. Uh, you need to be clear that you're going to be uh, on the side of people that are coming in if they're marginalized at all. And that's from any, any particular variety. Uh, another thing, um, outreach matters. Um, it's one thing to say, oh sure, we'll take anybody. It's another thing to actually reach out to people and ask them to be here. Um, honestly, that's why I'm here. I wouldn't be here otherwise. Um, and um, with almost any group, if you're saying, oh, it would really be nice if we had more X here. Uh, it's then not really a good way to go forward to say, oh, well, but nobody who's X ever shows up, so I guess we're fine. Uh, you really need to go looking for them. Um, allies matter. And um, this is one that I'm, I'm starting to appreciate more and more. Um, I can tell you, and, and this is one of the secrets from the boys club that I give away, um, that um, there seems to be, in a group of guys, it seems to be very, very hard to call out each other for sexism. I know this because I was trying to figure out how to be a guy for years, so I was watching, and I sort of learned that that's kind of an unspoken rule. Um, more extreme, if you're talking about trans people, another example, it's really hard to stand on the side of a trans person from what I've seen. It's done so rarely. So what we need then is actually for allies who are willing to be allies and stand with us, whether it's women, whether it's people of color, whether it's trans people, sexuality, whatever it is, we need that. 
Because honestly, if a woman calls out men on sexism, it goes right over the head. Uh, if I, as a trans person, call people out on transphobia, yeah, people seem to survive that pretty well. So we need the help. Um, here's another one, uh, just in my observation. Safe and friendly welcoming spaces are very, very powerful. Uh, people seem to resent them. Why? Why do they get a workshop and we don't? Why can't everybody be in there? Uh, this shows up all the time. Uh, in fact, uh, having that space that actually, where instead of being marginalized, you actually are the default group, is enormously, enormously powerful. Um, and my second example of that, actually, uh, is where I was last week, which was Trans Hack, which was the first hackathon ever devoted to transgender issues. Um, so this is what, here we have um, both transgender people and cisgender allies. You might be able to tell who's who for some of them, but not for all of them. But this was the first time for many of us when we got together to do something in the tech world where we weren't alone where we were all together. Uh, so I can tell you that if people are complaining about, oh no, we shouldn't have an event devoted to whatever marginal group, um, you don't understand. You just don't understand. So, uh, and there I am in the back. Uh, but uh, so that's kind of where I'm going here. Um, I guess I want to wrap this up. By, by taking another crack at that rhetorical question. And I would tell you that open necessarily implies diversity. If it's not open, why are, if it's not diverse, why are we even pretending to be open? Uh, do you really want five people who are exactly alike looking at the code, or do you want five people who are different looking at the code? So um, I would leave you with just the notion that if we're talking about open, it has to mean open to everyone. So thank you. <laughs>